You're listening to One Free Family, a new take on peaceful parenting, where you can hear ideas for helping to raise free, independent, and peaceful children. Visit OneFreeFamily.com to connect and listen. Here are your hosts, James and Taylor Davis. We are back with another episode of One Free Family. This is James. And this is Taylor. And we're excited to record a new episode. And you're actually going to introduce the topic today. I'm going to do it. And you guys can tell us if you hate it when I introduce. And we'll go back to James. No, because they're not actually going to tell you if they hate it. They're just going to want to make you feel good. Yeah, well, I'm about to do a really great job. So (laughs) (laughs) we were trying to figure out what we wanted to talk about today. And I was thinking about one of the things that I'm most grateful for when it comes to the life that we live and the life that we've been building for ourselves and our family. And that is that we as a family have the ability to really honor each other's and every member of our family's natural rhythms when it comes to just kind of people's personal needs, especially around when they're feeling more active and energetic and when they're feeling more sleepy and like they need to maybe rest or just chill out for a little bit, when their creative energy is high, all of these things, when they're maybe more irritable. And because we've taken so many steps throughout the years to have a life where we're both self-employed and our kids don't go to school and we kind of direct our own days a little more than having to go through the steps of like a nine to five and uh, getting the kids to school, we have a lot of space to honor our own natural rhythms and to help our kids honor their natural rhythms. So that's what we wanted to talk about a little bit, a lot of it today. For the whole episode, basically. For the whole episode. And I think I'm probably knocking it out of the park here. I'm not sure. (laughs) So can I jump in for a second? James is laughing at me and he's going to fix something that I've messed up. (laughs) (laughs) My plan wasn't to fix anything that you messed up, but also just to lend some clarity around. I feel like this is a topic that actually really does apply to anyone, regardless of what your family situation is. So while it's become a point of emphasis in our family to try and figure out yeah, how everyone operates or try to find these patterns in people's needs and interests and that sort of thing. I feel like if you do work a nine to five and you're not around one another all day, every day, this is still totally applicable and still totally possible. So I don't want you to feel like, oh, I should just turn the episode off now because that's not, this isn't going to work for me. Because I feel like if you listen to a podcast like this, you're interested in your family dynamic and you have a family dynamic even if it's for like less absolute time every single day, still patterns emerge and natural rhythms need to be honored and that sort of thing. Yeah, I totally agree. And you can, I think, honor your family members' natural rhythms to whatever extent you're able to within the schedule that you need to keep for your family. I totally think that that's true and possible. Yeah. And I also want to jump in and say too, that like a lot of times, one of the big reasons we moved toward a lifestyle that looks like this is because we realized that a lot of the natural ways of being that we had, and especially for our mm. oldest son, Ollie, couldn't be honored by the, uh, the old lifestyle that we had Good where man. he was being sent to daycare and really rejecting it and all those sorts of things. And so in the future, we hope to talk about bring on a, another surprise guest about leading a more purpose-driven life. But the idea being that sometimes in order to honor people's natural rhythms, if a rhythm is important enough and feels mandatory enough, sometimes It can't be honored without a fundamental lifestyle change. Without really, really bigger changes. And in other times, it can just be kind of smaller tweaks. Yeah, because sometimes... Sure. And we can like start probably jumping into it at this point. But because sometimes there are things in our life where essentially, if we can start to think intentionally and even just notice that the pattern emerges, oftentimes a, a pretty straightforward fix avails itself without that much work. It's just like you have to just recognize like, oh, look at me when I stay up really late binge watching Netflix. I'm too tired to be as attentive to my kids as I want to be patient with my kids. Yeah. In the morning. So I need to like do some real thinking about what my priority here is. So if, uh, if Netflix is a priority for me, can I find time at some other point in the day rather right. than staying up until 2 a.m. or stretching the shows out? So, uh, so yeah, let's just jump right in because I think what we're hoping to talk about is the idea that like all of the members of our family system are individuals that have totally unique needs from one another. I think if we can understand that as a baseline, just like first principle of a family dynamic, then we're going to be a lot more equipped to want to observe and honor each other's rhythms, right? Yeah. And I think it's really kind of a slippery slope and it's easy to get caught in the thinking or almost to get caught forgetting that our kids are unique individuals with different needs and rhythms than we are. Because 
it's it's sometimes just easy to forget that, I think. And if we can go back to the place of really empathizing with and observing our kids, we'll see pretty easily that trying to fit them into whatever our own natural rhythms are is in many times just a losing proposition for everybody. Well, sure. And I think just on a basic level, society, and I think it can go both ways. And I want to get back to that in a second. But I think on a basic level, society is not really structured with children's needs in mind, right? Like even the simple hours that kids go to school are designed because that's when most grownups go to work, which I mean, and from pr- a practical sense, of course that makes sense. Right, like, But like think back to being yeah. a teenager and having to get up so early to get to school. That was terrible for oh, me. Oh, I mean, sitting in my chemistry class with my right. head on my desk. At like eight in the morning. Yeah. Just like yeah. in and out of sleep. Yeah. Like that was just not good for anyone involved. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that would be a very straightforward, you know, Peter Gray calls it uh, an evolutionary mismatch, which I really like the idea that we force people to wake up at a certain time, just as totally counter to our evolution. And normally when you're woken up for something as we were all evolving, it was because there was like an emergency. <laughs> no, no. Right. If you didn't just wake up naturally kind of with, yeah. Nature. Yeah. Cause you would just develop <laughs> your own rhythm. Right. Uh, but on the flip side, I think that this reminds me of uh, the question we brought up to Fiona on last week's episode that was posted to our Facebook group, which was about, well, what if, in this case, it was, what if mom has her own individual needs, right? She needs a little bit of that introvert, a little bit of that me time, Mm -hmm. right? And asking how to accommodate that. But, and I don't think this person was asking this, but like, I feel like I've heard a lot of parents sort of asking for permission to uh, take a little me time, right? Meet their own needs. Yeah. I want to be a a peaceful parent. I want to be a, help my kids along the self-directed journey. I want to honor their needs and their rhythms. And man, at the end of every day, I'm so exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, well, Hey, you are also, when we talk about each individual having their own needs in the family, that's true. But I think you actually want to start with identifying your own needs and identifying your own rhythms before you can get involved in the practice of trying to help other people along the right, So path, that you're right? coming at it from a, from a healthy place yourself. And from a place of experience doing it. Mm-hmm. I think we can a lot more authentically help our children when it's something that we've worked on for ourselves. Right. And I think, you know, when you can speak to your own struggles in a situation, you know, not necessarily like steering the conversation to make it all about yourself, but you can talk from a place of experience and say, Hey, I've also tried to identify what sleep patterns work best for me recently. And Mm. here's what that process has looked like for me. And here's what I'm noticing. You know, here's the similarities I'm noticing uh, that you're going through. So it's that modeling again, right? You're kind of doing it yourself and getting experience with it. And your kids are seeing you do that and seeing like, this is a real thing that people do, not just something dad's trying to make me do. Right. Yeah. Or trying to convince me to do. I think I also just want to say that this whole idea even though it's kind of, we're used to it at this point. Like, I think it's a pretty radical idea in some ways, because I think many of us are, we kind of grow up in mainstream culture, which essentially sends us a lot of messages to like ignore and override our own natural rhythms so that we can fit into Mm -hmm. kind of like the day-to-day expected flow of society. Like, I think there's a lot of messaging around it's better to be a morning person and to get up early and go to bed early because that's just a more productive way of living. And it's better to, if you're tired in the middle of the day, go ahead and drink a cup of coffee instead of take a rest because you just got to keep going and you got to keep producing. And not that coffee is bad. I love coffee. But I think it's there's so many messages that kids and teenagers and adults internalize about we have to fit into what the world expects of us and honoring our own natural rhythms is kind of like a sign of weakness or it's going to make us less productive and less useful. And so I think this idea is actually radical, being able to say like, no, your natural rhythm is important and you are actually going to be a happier person and contribute more positively to society if you can honor that and get into your own flow in a way that you're not overriding what your body is telling you that you need. Yeah. And I think it's honoring it to the degree that it's possible. Like some of us of aren't, course. Just aren't going to be able to find jobs that start in the afternoon or whatever all Absolutely. the time. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I think it's more for me, it's actually more about self-knowledge than it is about uh, honoring my needs at all times necessarily. Because I think if I can at least be aware of what's going on with myself, then I have the power to make a decision whether I feel like honoring that natural rhythm or not. Right. So like I might say like, okay, I do a lot better on at least seven hours of sleep. Right. Mm -hmm. But I might say, well, for this week though, it's worth it for me 
to take on a little sleep debt because I have this thing I'm really passionate about, or I really want to honor, or I want to help out with my kid staying up late to do this thing he's been working on or whatever. Right. But it's the idea of conscientiously making a choice rather than I think where I've been in the past, which is just kind of like sleepwalking through life, right. unaware of my own needs. Right. Or, so like in that situation, yeah. you might choose to take on a little sleep debt, but at this point you're also aware of how that might affect you and you can employ some strategies to still get through your days like peacefully and happily because exactly. you're recognizing what you're taking on. Yeah. Like I remember when we were at our old summer camp that we used to live at and these live action role players would come through, some of whom listen to the podcast, by the way, which is oh, really hey exciting. But- and gals. But I remember <laughs> Saturday nights when I would want to go out and play with them, I would stay up until like 1 or 2 a.m. sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I would make that choice. But And I would know that I would be tired the next day. Yeah. But I but in choosing that and recognizing it, I could deal with the, fa- the idea of being tired a lot more easily, if that makes sense. Yeah, because right? you had the self-awareness to know like this isn't exactly in line with what my body needs, but it's worth it for me to make this yeah. choice this week. And I'm going to be gentle with myself and support myself through yeah, it. And I could relive my epic battles the next day in my own mind. And that would oh. keep you going. Totally. <laughs> exactly. But actually that speaks to a different uh, need and rhythm in my life, which is a need for play, a need to do things for just like no point at all, just because it's fun. Like mm-hmm. that's, that is something I've actually, the, the, the LARP or live action role play incidentally helped me re-identify in myself that I actually am a lot more alert and available in the rest of my life Mm. when I do have some play-based thing happening in my life. Right. And so a a part of also identifying your natural rhythms is yeah, giving yourself permission to follow them, even if it seems kind of weird. Right. Right. Even (laughs) if somebody from the outside might look in and be like, why is this 36 year old man just playing? Like, doesn't he have better things to do? And there's implicit judgment that goes all around here. Right. It's like, you even hear this in the, I've been pretty deep into the space of like, self-improvement or trying to start a business or whatever. And there's this implicit judgment of, well, it's time to stop sitting around watching Netflix at nighttime. It's mm-hmm. time to get buckled down and get serious. And that I think flies in the face of, well, okay. It's all well and good to say that that is time where you could be productive. And what if that is that person's recharging time? Exactly. You know, like, well, what if that's how they recharge? Yeah. Are you yeah. going to just basically let make this person run on fumes to start right. a business? Is <laughs> right. that really a sustainable thing? Or is it more about put down the Netflix, but is it instead would a better conversation be to say like, is there a way you can recharge yourself while working on your future? Right. So it's not about Mm -hmm. denying yourself something pleasurable. It's about finding pleasure in something else or something. Right. Sure. But yeah, I think when it comes to the importance of rhythms in our own lives and and, in the lives of our kids, it starts with not invalidating the fact that like most people are doing whatever they're currently doing for some reason, right? And so like, right. if we're going to change that, the change is hard and that what you're doing now probably is worthwhile, even if you want to cause a change in it. So should we talk a little bit about what it looks like in our family? Is that... Yeah, well, it's, and I, I think a good place to start here would be how do we actually observe these patterns? How do we keep track of things and gain more self-knowledge or gain more knowledge of the rhythms that seem to be presenting themselves in our family? Because I think it's all well and good to like some patterns are just going to be so obvious and someone out there is listening and going like, Oh, of course, like me and my partner both know that there's this like witching hour for our toddler at nighttime. We've seen this happen. It's even, there's even a societal term for it for babies, especially. So maybe it's less about And they're going, oh, right. So maybe I shouldn't uh, just try to fix the fact that there's a witching hour and just be aware of it and mentally prepare, right? So Mm -hmm. some of the patterns are going to be very obvious, but like, what about when it takes a little bit more detective work? (laughs) Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about what we've seen with our kids. And because I think that's a good lens to share some examples. And then we can maybe give some ideas for how people can get more in tune with their own family's needs. Yeah. I mean, if you have a place to go, go. Yeah. So I think, I think we could probably talk about it for any of our kids, but I'll start with one of our kids. This is kind of what spurred this episode idea for me. Our middle child, I've noticed less on a day-to-day basis and more on like longer periods of time basis. He goes through these kind of cycles where he'll have a chunk of days or a week or so where he's super high energy, um, super curious about everything, super engaged, active, wanting to ask questions and have conversations about anything under the sun, kind of up for any adventure. And then 
he'll kind of move through a time period like that. And then he'll have a time period, a chunk of days or a week or more again, where he's much less energetic and active and creative, where he's kind of, it's almost like he, what I've started to think, it's like almost like those periods of intense creative energy need to be balanced out for him with these quieter, more introspective periods where he's a lot less active. He is honestly a lot less conversational. Mm -hmm. He wants to kind of just do more calm activities. He just kind of wants to chill. And I, I was thinking about this because currently today, he's still in the midst of one of these like super energetic creative periods. And when he's like that, he's so fun for us to be around. And it's, it's like, he's like the poster child. I feel like for unschooling when this happens, like he's just like, you would look at him and be like, oh my gosh, like, what are they doing that he's like this? It's not really anything that we're doing. It's just, he's in a phase where he's just curious about everything. And he has these super creative ideas and he's just really fun to be around. And during those phases, we've noticed he's also typically like very considerate of others, wanting to be very helpful, like all of these things. And I was thinking about this and trying to to like prepare myself because for me, when he comes out of one of those periods and he has one of his quieter periods, that challenges me because I think I still am stuck sometimes in the kind of in the idea that people should always be creatively producing and engaged and active and that's a better way of being and when he goes through one of his more quieter periods I feel the fear rising for me well because in those periods it can look like the uh, poster child against unschooling right like mm-hmm. where there is more like like as far as society is concerned yeah. right? it's more of the you know, sedentary activities. It might be a lot of consumption, like of videos on YouTube or something like that. And additionally, I think, I mean, you nodded to this, but like your kind of like emotional attachment to those creative periods, I think has you wanting to hold on to them. In the right. Past. And so that's, and, yeah. And this is like a big, this is by the way, something that we've only uh, started talking about in the last couple of days. So this is like very fresh off our parenting. Just with him plate. that we've yeah, well, observed. And, just, and you yeah. and I conversation around our attitudes about it because our attitudes in the past have been, he goes through these periods of creativity, which we've seen. And then he goes through these periods where he's like highly ex- reactive and explosive and hard to be around and stuff. And it's like, as we do some self-reflection, is it, I guess we start, we're finally asking ourselves, well, is it actually that he's hard to be around or that, we're hard to be around for him well, that's because exactly. we're trying to, you know, shoehorn him back into that other way of being that he just was. And right. And that's where I, to, right. Know. That's where I was going with this it was like, I think that my default has been to see the quieter periods as worse and wanting to hold on to those super engaged, energetic, creative times and almost trying to like shepherd him back to that way of being. Mm. And it, probably is so annoying for him <laughs> to like, I think in those times he can sense. And, and that's the other thing. He's super perceptive and sensitive, I think, to the way that we feel. And so he can sense, I think, and sometimes it's just way more overt. Like sometimes I, it's just it's very clear that I would prefer that he be the other way, right. Mm-hmm. Or that he'd be going, you know, in one of his more engaged, creative, active times. So I, this morning, I just kind of had that realization of like, well, what if these seeming, like in my head, I call them lulls, aren't actually bad? Like, what if they are just a part of his natural rhythm and his way of living his life and moving through the world? Like, he's so intensely engaged at times that what if he just needs these other times to decompress? And what if I could let go of the fear that he'll never be creative again? Because <laughs> I think that's what gets me. I'm like, yeah. he goes through one of these quieter periods, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, it's over. Like this is it. The rest of time he he's not going to want to get the old Yeah, he's not going to want to talk too. about all the questions of the universe and run around and play and create and build right. and all this stuff. And I am actually starting to wonder now if my attitude about it is what makes those quieter periods actually more tumultuous for him and mm. thus for our family. Like what if I could just let go and support his need to decompress and chill out? Maybe he would – I think he would continue to decompress and chill out during those time periods, but maybe it would reduce the amount of, yeah, like explosiveness well, or he's tension. Not re- he's not recharging while he's having to 
feeling like he has to yell at people for not giving him the space he needs. Exactly. Right? Like, so that takes away from yeah. that whole process. So that was a huge realization that I had this morning and that's kind of what spurred talking about these natural rhythms. And so now I'm thinking about, okay, next time he goes through one of these quieter times, what are my strategies going to be to support him and to honor it and to not um, not have him feel like I'm worried or unsatisfied. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think that last piece, the not having to worry that worry about how someone else is perceiving you mm -hmm. in a hard time. Like how, how many people adults can identify with how annoying it is when someone like is like, what's wrong? You, something seems wrong. Oh, and he and, hates when I do that. Well, I know, yeah. but like, and now think about like, say you've had, I mean, what comes to mind for me and maybe it's unfair is like, you know, maybe like a needier significant other who like, is like, oh, like, what's wrong? Come on. What's wrong? And you're like, nothing is wrong. I just am a little quieter right now than yeah. I normally am. And, and I need a little space here to just be, be that way. Yeah. Because I've been on the other side too. I've also been the needy significant other who just wants to keep asking what's wrong, what's wrong, right. what's wrong. And that's not, it doesn't feel good to have someone constantly imply that something is wrong if you're just like, taking a quieter time. Right. And, and for sure, I mean, when I was reflecting on this too, I was thinking about myself and how I have times of greater energy and times of less energy. And while I maybe don't, whether this is true or not, I believe that I'm not able to as fully honor the lower energy periods to the full extent because like I just have kids to take care of and right. a house to take care of and things to do. I can honor it in smaller ways. And if my child who is six can honor it to like the fullest extent right now, I think that's actually a beautiful thing. And if I could support him to do that, I think that there would be a lot more peace and he would also start to gain a lot more self-knowledge just around the way that he operates. Yeah. Well, and I think it's okay in a situation like that to point out in a non judgmental way, like, Oh, is it feeling like a little bit of a quieter day today? You mm -hmm. know, like totally like, cause, and again, you'll see, I feel like we have such a, a weird love hate relationship with this as a society, because I'm just going back to social media where you'll see someone say like, post a picture and it's like a mug of hot chocolate. It's like, it's just one of those weekends. It's pajamas and hot chocolate and, you know, watching 90210 reruns or something. Right. And it's like, on one hand, that scene of course is like totally valid and okay to take some time to recharge. And I think society allows that space for grownups, but for kids in many cases, there's almost like this, there's almost this like implied attitude that they're always relaxing anyway, right? Like, what do you need to relax from? There's no right, stress in your right. life. You don't, what do you need downtime from? You're just kind a kid. of trivializing. You yeah. You don't have bills yeah. and, you know, relationship problems or, you know, whatever. But the, Right. Right. But in their mind, obviously, and this is an example I've used maybe on the podcast, but certainly in talking about kids before it's like back to when a kid is really crying about something that seems insignificant to you as a grown up. Um, instead of thinking like, why is this kid just sobbing about this absurd thing? It's flipping it on its head and thinking like, wow, when was the last time I was crying like this? And ha think about what big emotions I needed to be feeling in order mm -hmm. to be this sad. Well, that's how my kid is feeling right now. So Right. And whatever. it doesn't matter how insignificant I think it is. And, and I think that's such a great point because when you think about like, oh, what do kids need to decompress from? Um, well, I think kids have a lot they need to decompress yeah. from. Even kids who are kind of supported to live their lives the way that they want to, like they're still kind of at the whims of the grownups in their lives to some extent. They're very course, dependent yeah. upon us. And not to mention just growing up is, is like a ton of work. Like the physical changes that your body goes through, the mental and emotional things that you're trying to get a grip on, um, that's a lot. And yeah. there's so much to being able to support the ebb and flow that they need with that. Yeah. And it, obviously like once your kid's hormones start, kitchen sure. and like all sorts of stuff. There's just a lot to deal with when you're a kid. And it's interesting when you're a kid, you know that intuitively. <laughs> but, you might not be able to name it, but yeah. yeah. But as soon as like, I don't know, I feel like we're our recency bias uh, always wants to place a higher, uh, like a higher priority or a higher level of importance on problems that we're currently facing. And it's very easy mm -hmm. for us to look back and be like, Oh, well, that was so silly. When I was in high school worrying about if I was popular, ha ha ha, that right. was stupid. It didn't feel that stupid when I was no, in high school. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, well, I, I, I want to talk about how we can sort of like find these patterns a little bit, because I like the idea of talking about, of course, how to deal with 
or how to acknowledge these rhythms and help people work through them once we've discovered them. But that okay. process of discovery can be really hard for a lot of people, you know, like, I don't know. I think we were talking about this off the air. So maybe hopefully just stop me if I'm giving the very same example I gave earlier, but like, I think a lot of people have stressors in their lives, let's say, or times of day that feel harder for them or times of day where they feel an urge to do a certain thing or whatever, but they never really sit and take time to become aware of that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, you'll hear this I talked about the witching hour with toddlers or whatever. It's something that parents, when it just beats you over the head with it, you can sort of acknowledge it. Right. Um, and now your attitude about that is going to be a different thing. Like the idea of acceptance versus hoping to change things. But I think sometimes it can be a little bit more subtle than that. And this is where I personally have had success with actually trying to collect data on these things. Um, and, you know, one of the things I did for my own personal life many years ago was... I wanted to keep track. I was encouraged to try to keep track of things that were causing me to, you know, elicit a frustrated response throughout the day, just to try to be more aware of, yeah, just to try to be more aware of myself. It was like a mindfulness practice. And so what I did was I carried a notebook around and whenever I audibly expressed frustration at something or physically like throwing my hands up or something like that, I would take out this notebook and I would, all I would mark was a time, a rough time and put a little check mark. And that was it. And if I wanted to make more notes, I would, but generally just the time and the check mark was all I really had time for. Uh, because even though at the time I was perceived as a pretty easygoing and tough to ruffle person, I was expressing these periods of frustration, like between 20 and 30 times per day. And that felt like a very high number to me. Um, but through this product process of data collection, I realized that there were certain things that were causing me frustration on a very, very routine basis that I once I noticed it, I just felt it was silly, like getting frustrated. We lived in the country, getting frustrated audibly at our slow internet speeds. Right. Mm -hmm. So this was, it wasn't really like a rhythm of myself, but it was just this pattern that was coming up in my day. And once I knew it was there, I was like, oh, well, that's silly. <laughs> why, why am I spending like, you know, 20% of all times I get frustrated throughout the day. It's like, because the internet is slow. I just need to understand that that's true. And no matter how frustrated I right. get about it, it's not going to change. And so why I think this process can be good in our family lives is when we're wrapped up in the actual day in the moment, it's very hard to, especially at the end of a day, let's say you're a stay at home parent. I mean, by the, the day's end, so much crap is going to have happened. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're likely have... very emotionally exhausted. You don't remember the finer minutia of the day and the ups and the downs, right? Like yeah. you may have captured like that one moment where Daphne was bopping around and she was, uh, just wanted to work on that art project with the leaves or whatever. Like you were aware of that in the moment, but you didn't realize that that always seems to happen at 10 AM, right? Like right. We're just not very good at identifying patterns like that where, you know, or like, you know, another one in our family was when, when there's like uh, a certain kid that interacts with our kids, like, Oh, Hmm. I just noticed that times are always like a lot more creative when this kid is over or when right. this kid is over, there's a lot more tension in the house. Mm -hmm. Or So I, I like the idea of just having a little notebook on myself, or you can even use an iPhone for this or whatever, where it says, or an Android or an Android phone device. I have uh, an Android. So I just want to be included here. <laughs> Congrats on your Android, <laughs> by the way. Uh, but yeah, just keep monitoring these things. And so as you collect, I mean, a journal would work for this as well, but I really like doing it in the moment because then at the end of the day, or whenever I want to kind of reflect on things, I have an objective measure of things. And even over the course of a week or something for these, not, it won't work for like you talked about these longer cycles that can last weeks or more, but over the course of a week, I would guess that almost everybody would start to notice like getting out of the house in the morning. Whoa. Like that's a time <laughs> where things are hard. I need to dissect why that is like, mm -hmm. or for me, I always start dreaming on my next big business ideas around 7 PM. Is there a way I can ask for time mm -hmm. from my partner to actually just use that time for right. creative things instead of, you know, preparing the kids lunches for the next day of school. Or right. Or one for us. And we weren't actually physically tracking this, but one that came up for us was like somewhere between the hours of one and 3 PM, at least one, if not both of our older kids really kind of just hit a wall in terms of energy and ability to cope with challenges. Right. And that one took us because we weren't physically tracking it, took us a while to notice. But when we did, we were able to a have the 
kind of like understanding when it would happen and be able to employ some strategies to support them through that. Right. And I think if you're tracking both ends, like basically yeah. just checking things that stand out to you, their direction, like, whoa, this is a really cool moment happening right now. Like just a little check mark, like 2 p.m. E&G fun game or something. Right. right. But just trying to first observe, and I think it always starts with ourselves. I would suggest ignoring trying to track your own family's rhythms until you can try to figure out how you're doing at different times of day. Um, you know, that's why for me, I drink my cup of tea at a certain time of day, right? Because I noticed that mm-hmm. that is a time of day where uh, that recharges me a little bit, right? even if it's sort of a false charge of stimulating my nervous system with caffeine. But that is a time of day where I could use that little pick me up or when, when for me, a nap actually isn't viable. <laughs> for, right. You have to work. PM. And I think you've also noticed about yourself that sometimes you feel really bad after an afternoon nap. Like that doesn't actually help you as much. I think I could deal with an afternoon nap just if we're being real. I know, but I think you've said in the past, like (laughs) your rhythm works much better with just sleeping in in the morning more than... Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could deal with an afternoon nap. (laughs) I'm like, hold on. (laughs) Sorry, sorry. I don't think this conversation is going to go towards me not getting my afternoon (laughs) naps occasionally. But but yeah, sorry, you distracted me trying to take my naps away. (laughs) I'm so sneaky like that. On on the podcast. But yeah, so once... And then once we gather these data, I think we can, whether it's, you know, anecdotally just by thinking about it or by tracking it, that's when we can start to have the discussions around, you know, when we zoom out on our family and view it as an ecosystem and say like, just like in a real life ecosystem outside the family, like, well, the trees don't need the same thing as the squirrels, which don't need the same thing as the fish. Like everyone has their own needs. And once we identify that, we can recognize that um, the goal isn't to get everyone an equal amount of things. It's to get each person the things that they actually need or, you know, whether that's space and time to be creative in certain areas or it's, uh, you know, can you think of any other good examples there from our life? Um, well, one thing, this isn't always our life as much, but sometimes it is, <clears throat> excuse me, you mentioned when we were planning was noticing that your kids have like a really big burst of energy at like 8 PM. Mm. And that I know Another classic, why are uh, the kids always so energetic right before bed? Right. And I know for me, like at 8 PM, I am done. Like mm. I actually lately have just been going to bed at eight with whatever kids want to go to bed with me. So that's really hard for me. And when our kids go through phases where they have that burst of energy being able to acknowledge that that's happening almost daily is a great first step. And then the next step is like, okay, so how do we work with this, right? It's not necessarily a terrible thing that they have this burst of energy, but my energy level is not matching their energy level at this time of night. And that feels really hard. So what can be done? Can I, can I talk to James and can he be able to engage them in that kind of play at eight o'clock at night? Can I set up a space that's safe where they can engage in that play away from me so I can still chill, but they can do their thing. Or can I, this one I think is trickier. Like, can I engage them in more active play around 5 PM so that they work out some of that energy? Now I would say that may not always work because that's me trying to change their natural rhythm. You know, gently shift it, I would say. I yeah, would think to it's... gently shift it. And that might work for some people. So it's more about when you recognize this pattern, then you have the opportunity of trying to figure out like, do I want to change? Do I like, is it worth trying to change this rhythm? Um, if it is, what tweaks can we make? And if it's a rhythm that might just be better to just, and easier to honor for my kids, how can I support it in a way that feels okay to everybody, including myself? Yeah, that's a great call. And I think it's interesting because the reality of all of our lives is that for almost everybody, you're not going to be able to fully be in tune with exactly the state of being that you want to be in in that moment, right? So right. Like, you're living in community. Yeah. There's or like multiple you just, people. You get a job and there's no siesta option right. from two to totally. four, right? <laughs> so like identifying it and then moving on. But what we've seen, actually, this is a very timely example as well. It uh, reminds me of daylight savings time. Like for many people at first, and daylight savings time, horrible idea, by the way, for just kind of <laughs> <laughs> complaint of the week, just the fact that daylight savings time exists is a complete joke. But we can talk about that and maybe... At another time, or probably uh, never. That probably suffice. Yeah, you think so? Yeah. You think that covered it? Okay. That's good. No daylight savings related rant needed? Okay. No, we're good. Okay. But what it does is it is very instructive on how basically everyone is capable of shifting their day's rhythm by an hour. You know? <laughs> like right. Most people start, like in this fall one, where in the Northeast here, where you, okay, oh, I'm waking up a little earlier now. Like, I'm just going to stick with the... And then you just pretty much shift back into the same right. pattern you were in. Even your kids, by the way. Even your dog. Like, things that have mm-hmm. no real 
probably places to be or intrinsic motivation, you can adapt. So I think when there are rhythms that simply do not fit, gentle changes can help make it more easy, right? Sure. Like you talked about, like maybe 8 p.m. isn't quite the right time for this crazy play, like, but maybe tomorrow night trying it at 7.50 and then 7.45 and Mm -hmm. (laughs) like a gentle shifts in either direction would probably be a much more, because I feel like a lot of times people get caught up in a, in things being a binary. Like, I just don't want my kids to be playing crazy at nighttime, right? We get stuck in like, this isn't feeling good and I'm stuck here and there's nothing I can do. Right. Versus like denying that probably incremental moves could be made to help everything sort of mesh back together. Because while we're a family of these individual units, none of us exists in isolation from one another either. And so like your natural rhythm might be, my natural rhythm actually is to stay up later than anyone else in the family. And I need to be a, a considerate that even if my natural supposed natural rhythm tells me that I want to bang on the drums late at nighttime, right. I just can't bang on the drums late at nighttime. Yeah. So I need to figure out a way to be considerate while also trying to meet my own needs. And I think, again, this is a call for, I say this a lot, staying curious and staying open about just thinking outside of the box about how to approach these different things. Like it's, it's almost never a black and white, like we can do this or we can't, or I can support this or I can't. It's like, okay, what are all of the different options for working with this situation or this pattern that I've noticed? And what can maybe lead us towards the best outcome we can find for everybody. It might not be every person's perfect outcome, but it'll support everybody in the best way possible. And I would also argue that when your kids are old enough, if they're involved in whatever this pattern is you've observed, to include them in the conversation because they're going to, A, have a lot more buy-in if they're included, and they may have ideas that you would never have thought of that are great. So kids can be a part of this conversation for sure. Yeah, 100%. I think that the I, one of the main goals here would be to, in my mind, to help kids try to learn and identify with their own patterns and that, or and that own their own process of identifying their own natural rhythms and doing their best to try and meet them. And also learning strategies for kind of coping and supporting themselves when it might not be possible to fully meet them. Mm -hmm. So helping them to learn, like you said, like I'm just not like you. You said you're not going to take a nap every day at one. So you have your cup of tea and you take that little breather. And so helping our kids discover strategies for themselves when it might not be feasible to always listen to those natural rhythms is helpful too. Yeah. And I think the thing we keep circling around is this idea that we're going to have natural rhythms in, you know, these very obvious ways, like times of day we want to eat, times when we want to sleep, and we're going to have ones that are a little softer and less obvious, right? And so I think a good you know, way to another way to like observe these patterns that are coming up are think about if there are frequent, like especially frequent recurring discussions that happen between either you and your partner or you and your kids. I think an example I can think of from our life is like getting out of the house, right? Where, and I hope you don't mind me (laughs) disclosing this, but like you really have a strong desire to get out of the house and go out and do things, right? Yeah. Not because I don't like being in the house, but I just like being out in the world and seeing people. And yeah. Yeah. And my feeling is that Basically, everyone likes to be out in the world some amount, right? But most people, yeah. In many people's houses, the person who wants to be out the most is probably the person who drives a lot of the planning and a lot of the maybe the trips or the things that wind up happening out in the world. Because for that person, if they don't take action to meet that need for themselves, it won't be met to the amount that they want it, right? So, and then if you take maybe I am, or maybe Gus, I are the youngest, but. I am the person who wants to go out the next to most, right? But since you're accounting for most of that, I don't really need to be the one who spurs it. But the the way we can observe this pattern as a as a natural rhythm of yours, I think, is the fact that if you are the one who f- is almost always initiating that conversation around, hey, should we get out and do something this weekend or this week or whenever, we, you and I, can observe as kind of the leaders of this family unit that that is a need of yours, that that's a rhythm of yours that we need to honor in order for our family to be a healthy system, right? Because if it's something that comes up that frequently, it's obviously really important. And let's just try and figure out how we can meet that need the best. So it might be all going out as a family, some amount of time, or it might be giving space for you to get out more, Right. right? So like in our family, we try to carve out 
as much time as necessary for you to go out and meet up with your friends. Right. Or to just take the toddler out if he's up for it and the others aren't. Yeah. But just meeting that in sort of a creative way. So instead of you just pushing for, well, everyone must go out the amount that I want to go out, which also doesn't necessarily honor the rhythms of everyone else in the family who might want to stay home a lot more. Totally. (laughs) And that would also all all of a sudden start to feel wrong. Like if our, especially one of our kids, if he had to go out as often as you wanted to go out, he would yeah, be that would not meet his needs at all. Yeah, he'd be really uninterested in doing mm-hmm. that. And it would sort of be counter uh, to our goals as parents. Right. right. That makes me think about probably why one of the reasons I've landed on doing the work that I do too, being mm. involved in my local birth community as a doula and childbirth educator is because it also is another way that I get out and interact with people that doesn't require me to bring other people in our family who might not be up for as many outings. Out. Exactly. So, and so if we reflect on that example as just one micro example from our family, but think about, you know, are there common recurring conversations that happen Mm -hmm. in your family? Like, you know, one of the ones I've seen is like, Oh, this kid never wants to leave the playground. Mm. It's like, is that rhythm that he or she or they or whoever is trying to communicate to you? Are they trying to say, I have a greater, my rhythm tells me I want to be out more. I want to be out and about, uh, is that, and you know, sometimes again, it's not feasible, but just recognizing what things continually pop up as a sign that there's an unmet need or an, a rhythm that's yeah. not totally in synced up with its natural self or whatever. And I really want to circle back you in listening to what you're saying to what I said at the beginning of the episode and kind of highlight the idea of, again, our personal rhythms as parents many times are not going to match our kids. And I think that there is such an unspoken expectation in our culture, in the dominant culture in America, at least, that our kids just go with the flow of what kind of our rhythm is, right? Right. And that that's just what they need to do so that things run smoothly. There will be less need for conversation and questions and it's just easier. And also like, that's what's best for them. And it's unspoken, but it's there and it's really strong. And so- I want to highlight that again, because I know that if you're sitting there thinking about questioning that kind of unspoken expectation and wanting to carve out more space for your kid to follow their own rhythm, then you're doing really hard work and you are going against the grain of what society expects. And I think that your kids are going to be so, so much better off for it. And I just kind of want to like encourage you to keep doing that work and honor that it is hard work because it is different than what we're told we should be doing. And so I also want to like recognize that there might even be some fear there for you because you might feel like, well, my way of moving through the world is serving me really well. So shouldn't my kid move through the world the same way that I am? Because it has me here happy and successful and I want the same for them. And so I see that fear and I feel that fear sometimes. And for me, it's been really, really actually freeing to try to challenge that for myself and to give my kids the space to move through the world the way that feels best for them. Sure. And I actually think that that societal agreement comes from an understandable place because nothing will disrupt the heck out of whatever rhythm you have more than having a child. Right? Totally. It's, <laughs> so, it's a lot easier if from the get go, we just get them to go along with our flow. And that is hard. I don't want to suggest that that's like the easy way out or anything, because when you have a kid, it's really disruptive to your rhythms. You have to mm-hmm. start identifying what feels right for you. And I think that the, the implication that society gives you that you should be entitled to whatever you had before you had kids. I think that's not helpful either. Like that doesn't put you in a good place in a good headspace because then it becomes all about getting things that you need. Right. And, and it's actually told like many of these things involve putting your kid on a schedule. Ironically, like yeah. um, if they have a specific nap time, a specific eating bed, whatever time that that will be what's best for you. And I think your point is like, cause that's a very natural. And I think a good it's a good thing overall that a parent identifies that they still do have needs, that they yes. still should consider their own self-care and they shouldn't be all about baby 24 seven, nothing else, but identifying that. I think what we're saying is that there just needs to be a balance and that actually, I think what will ultimately feel best for everyone mm-hmm. is when a balance is struck, because I think there's also part of, I think it ultimately creates more difficulties and more complications in the family system when we are overweighting one person's priorities or rhythms 
and underweighting the rest of the family. Yeah, and I would argue, and obviously I haven't seen this come to fruition with our own kids because they're still young, but I would argue too that helping our kids follow and learn their own rhythms now is going to hopefully buoy them in a way that's going to be good for them when they do start being on their own. Like course, if they're yeah. if they haven't spent their whole lives going through their days as, as they've been told and now all of a sudden they're free to do what they want and aren't even really sure where to begin. So for me that's part of my why in terms of why we're doing this too. It's feeling like with the information I have now that it's going to set them up in the best way that I can for directing their own lives when they get there. Yeah, and I think pretty clearly if people are never put in a position where they can experiment with finding their own rhythms, if they're just given a rhythm based up from their parents, they're going to experiment with seeing what else feels good, what else fits. And that process, I think if you haven't practiced it is more difficult, but that's just kind of a high level self-directed thing in general. So I think we've pretty much done it here. I think Uh, so too. Yeah. So good talk kind of, in and out all over the place in some ways, but I think that's kind of how life is anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And we didn't say it at the beginning, but definitely please come join us in our Facebook group. It's just one free family on Facebook. Um, We say it every week, but it really is one of my favorite places on the internet. There's just lots of really productive and supportive conversation around family life and parenting. And it's a great place to kind of share your ideas and ask some questions. So you can find us there. Great. So thanks so much for being on this journey with us. And just remember that each moment is a new chance to be the parent that you hope to be. Love you guys. See you next time. Thank you for listening to One Free Family. If you enjoy the podcast, please show your support by becoming a patron at onefreefamily.com slash support. Your support will help make this show better. Plus, you can get access to rewards and additional episodes by joining. Again, that's onefreefamily.com slash support. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast.